Okay, so today we are going to theoretically finish uh, Sanderson's Three Laws, but we're also going to spend a whole lot of time on characterization and viewpoint. That's what I want to dig into today. Um, and we'll probably do that first and then move on to, to get into the other laws if we need to. As I said last week, I really personally consider uh, character to be the most important feature of a story. A story with a fantastic character but a bland setting has a much better chance of succeeding than a story with a fantastic setting and a bland character. Ideally, I want you to learn to do both. Don't get me wrong. I'm not excusing weakness in either area. However, you have all read books and enjoyed books that have a rehash setting that, or story that's not that original. Harry Potter was not an original story. Harry Potter had, a great, um, had great characters. It had excellent execution. But Boy at Wizard School was a, a very common trope in fantasy. She just did it better than anyone else. It's kind of proof that if you, you can take any of these things and do them really well, people will latch on to it. And um, you will find that your readers will respond much better to a really great character than to anything else. Um, like I said, do all three, but great characters. This is going to make your book really feel alive as you kind of practice all of these other things. And uh, what do I mean by a great character? Well, I'll ask you, what is a great character? What, what in your opinion, what makes a great character? Okay, relatable, okay. Relatable, sure. Um, exists beyond the page. This one's dying. Okay, beyond the page. Oh, that's better. What else? Over here. Okay, backstory. Um, you really your reason is motivation. That's a pretty, pretty important one. Exhibits growth. Growth, okay, has an arc. All right. Admirable. Admirable, okay. Has human flaws as well. Okay. As flaws. And sympathetic you said over here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, that's a pretty good list. That's also a very challenging list. Your job is to do these things uh, and to bring your characters to life. Your job is creation. You are taking something that is unalive, the page, and you're making it feel alive as if there is somebody there who's real. That's your job. We're going to talk about how to do it. This is all very important stuff. Um, Early in my career, when I was writing books that didn't get published, um, I was dissatisfied with some of my characters. And I came to realize that one of the reasons for this was that I was thinking of them as their role first and who they were second. Um, it became, over the course of my career, a mantra to me, which was mentioned in here, that the character needs to live beyond the page. Specifically for me, I find that a character is more powerful if they have passions and motivations beyond the main plot. Beyond what the main plot would require of them, okay? People like things. We all like things. We're all interested in things. We have things we want to be doing. If today you were thrown into a major um, sort of plot, you have some 20 years of experience behind you, of a life behind you, of things that have happened, for some of us, more than that. Um, you, will, you would have been interrupted in your life. And I really, as a, as a writer, look for this sort of interrupted in the life. It's kind of a storytelling maxim that you know, the story happens when whatever the character was planning to have happen in their life gets interrupted. Now, this is slightly a problem because this is the, the basic way to start a story. You have a life, it gets interrupted. The problem with that is the characters then tend to be reactionary. They tend to be passive. Um, and this is another problem you'll run into. It is, is a major problem. You can see it um, most uh, powerfully sometimes in superhero films um, because they tend to follow a very specific 
cycle and they, they, they have a certain trope to them. In a lot of these, the hero would do nothing if there weren't a villain doing interesting things, interrupting their life. This runs you into a problem that you somehow need to make your character proactive. Despite the fact that they're being interrupted. Has anyone read a story where the villain was more interesting than, than the protagonist? This happens because the, the villain tends to be proactive. The villain has plans. The villain has passions. They have things that they're um, about and they're doing. And they have this great thing they want to achieve. They get interrupted by the hero um, you know, running afoul of their plans. And it innately builds this weird sympathy for the villain that is sometimes hard to overcome. You end up having these films that are about the villain rather than about the hero. This is a challenge for you as writers to be aware of that this happens. And it's because of these things. We are attracted as readers to characters who are proactive and who have a passion and who are doing things. All right? Um, we are also attracted to characters who are capable. Uh, okay, wow. Capable. Yeah, okay. Capable. We're attracted to characters who are capable. They, they, are, they excel at what they do. We're also attracted to characters who are sympathetic. That's part of kind of the definition of sympathetic. What it, let's go and dig into that. What does sympathetic mean? What makes a character sympathetic? The reader is able to feel what the character Okay, okay. Um, you empathize with them. So how can you make them uh, the reader empathize with the character? Okay, okay. They, they, they're certainly it is more easy to build when you have similarities. Similarities, good. Um, but one thing I'd point out here is it's hard to empathize with a character if they feel no emotion. Um, a lot of new writers it's harder for them to do emotion right. Once in a while, someone just throws emotion all over the page, and it uh, becomes melodrama. More often than not, you're just not writing emotion into your characters. Uh, they, they, this is a function of not being practiced enough at show versus tell, and watching um, a lot of films, and so writing your books cinematically where you aren't showing the emotions because you can't, you're not skilled enough to show the emotions, which is what a film does, right? It can't tell you the emotions, it has to show them to you. You're not skilled to pull that off yet, so you just don't put it in, which means that your characters become these robots who are fulfilling these action roles as if it were a film, and you never get this empathy because we don't know what they're feeling. Um, we, we start reading the book and say, wow, I, if, you know, if my dog got run over by a truck, I would be feeling this way, but this person just doesn't feel anything. Well, you're trying to write this character that they have like this stoic sense of, you know, I must continue on, um, and you know, they've got a strength inside, though inside they're really hurting, but you don't have the skill yet to pull it off, so you just don't mention it, and then your characters become robots. This is a major problem um, with new writers making um, characters sympathetic is that they just don't have any emotions. Um, going the other way and just telling us how they feel is also not necessarily the best thing to do. Uh, so you run into this catch-22. This one is show versus tell. It's where that comes into play quite a bit. All right. So sympathetic uh, characters usually are also um, flawed. Uh, you were right, whoever brought that up. Um, most really great characters are going to have some sort of flaw. Um, I also put in limitations as different from flaws. Um, and then there's the character arc. Um, so early on, I, I realized I was just sticking people into roles, right? Usually my main character was a little more rounded. All the side characters were incredibly flat. Um, you know, I would have the romantic interest. And she was in the book to be the romantic interest rather than to be a character unto themselves. Um, start thinking about this. Start asking yourself questions about how your character, what your characters would be doing. What would they be doing? What would they be searching for if the main plot of the book didn't hit them? Um, and if the story is really about them and their passion, then ask yourself, what are they beyond their passion? We are all more than one thing. 
Um, you can have you know, the bounty hunter who's also a stamp collector. Once you start adding in people's real human passions, then suddenly they become way, way more rounded. The bounty hunter who's a stamp collector, you can say that in one sentence, and that character, I can guarantee, just became more rounded in your head in an interesting way than the bounty hunter because the bounty hunter becomes this sort of faceless person who, you know, is whatever. Either you're thinking Star Wars and they wear a helmet, or you, so you can't even see the face, or you're thinking, you know, this gruff person who hunts down the protagonist or whatnot. Adding a few little touches like this, you don't have to go overboard, but adding a few little touches makes the characters come to life. Um, Blade Runner has the, um, the guy that, that makes origami, right? Anyone seen that film? Um, I mean, that simple thing, making the origami, makes us really sympathize with that character who's primarily really an antagonist. That makes me think of Tangled when there you go, when comes up playing going to the big bar and all these big nameless brutes right. are there, but then you'll find out they have hobbies like he likes making things, he plays the piano. Right, they, they kind of make fun of the trope a little bit in Tangled with that. Um, but yeah, yeah. I like the characters more. Yeah, you like the characters more. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily even be a direct contrast um, to, to who they are, but something. Um, and so this is, this is usually when, when authors are talking about quirks. They're talking about stuff like this. Um, ways to humanize your characters through small detail. All right? You can write that down. Ways to humanize your characters through small detail. Usually, when you write, write this word and you start talking to people, and you, if I were to ask for a list of quirks, you would go bonkers. You would say the most weird things that you could come up with, because that's kind of what the word quirk means to us. They don't have to be that weird. Um, now, weird can be very good. Depends on the type of story you're telling. And Tangled gets into that. Tangled is playing off of the contrast between big burly man and guy who wants to be a ballet dancer, or whatever it is that, you know, each of these, each of these guys has a, a really weird quirk for who you picture them being. Um, and that works for contrast, but it doesn't have to be humorous like that. Um, you, you have you know, characters who just do interesting things. What is it? Is it, is it Saving Private Ryan, where the guy takes, um, takes dirt from every place he's been? Um, that's cool. A simple thing to do, and suddenly you understand this person. That's a quirk, and it's not in direct contrast. It's just an expansion of who they are. Um, you can collect and gather these from people you meet and start stealing them like thieves. That's what you do. You're a writer. Um, and be watching just, and be thinking about this. You can have quirks, you know, hobbies, interests, Actions, um, tells. Having a tell for a character, particularly a side character, can be pretty useful. Uh, don't go overboard on this, but this is some sort of visual cue that sticks in the, the reader's mind as they encounter that character. Much more important for side characters that are not going to be having viewpoints than main characters. But if you will watch a lot of films or read a lot of books that quickly characterize, you will see that, someone ha that people have tells. Tells are things like, um, you know, this person is always tapping their foot. Um, or this person is the one with the eye patch. That's an easy tell to remember. Um, and giving them a tell that relates somehow to their hobbies or their quirks can be a very useful way to quickly characterize a side character and give them a little bit more rounding. Okay? This is one method. Um, another method is the dossier method. This is a method that a lot of writers use. I don't actually use this one, but one of my goals in this class is to give you multiple methods to try making your characters more rounded. One of them is to start thinking about their quirks. One is the dossier. The dossier is a, um, a list of questions you ask yourself about every character to force yourself basically to do this, but to also to come up with a backstory to, to fill out their passions and their interests and all of these sorts of things. It'll ask you things like, what's their favorite food? Um, you know, who do they hate most in life? Is this kind of like a literary um, representation of like method acting? Mm. That even if even if it's happening off stage, they they kind of create this persona for themselves. Yeah, sure. I mean, w what I would call the method acting part is what we're going to get into later, which is viewpoint, uh, which is how you use your viewpoint. But this is just good storytelling. 
I don't know if it counts as method acting or what. It's just ways to know your characters. Um, there, there's the old adage in writing that you generally want to look at storytelling like an iceberg, meaning what you show the reader is this much, but you, you ha have this much understanding about what's going on, um, and kind of give them hints about this much. Um, there, there is that theory of writing. Um, I do think this leads you dangerously toward uh, world builder's disease. Um, if you feel like you need to have this much before you can tell this much. Um, really, all you actually need to do is this much. Meaning, you have to show this much and be able to hint that there's all of this stuff down here. And if you can hint at it, then you don't actually have to do it. Because they'll make it up for you. Um, and that's part of the point of doing things like this. Um, my friend Dan, uh, excellent writer, always says skimp on the large details and uh, be very uh, forthcoming with the small details. Meaning when he wants to describe a room, instead of you walk into the room and him giving this big, long description of the room, he picks one small detail and focuses on it. Um, you know, the, the shack had bullet holes in the window. And gives you one very interesting detail about it or about the person so that you, you get this and then you begin imagining the entire world down here of all of these things. Dan is a discovery writer. I guarantee Dan doesn't have it much of this. Um, what Dan is really good at doing is making you think he has all of this and that's the point. We are, um, in a lot of ways, what we're doing as writers is we are stage magicians. All right? These worlds you're creating do not exist. At the, their fundamental core, you are telling a great big lie, okay? And your job is, while people are reading those pages, to convince them and make them pretend along with you that the lie is truth, okay? And the methods you use to do that are up to you. But like a good stage magician, usually you're wagging something in front of their faces while you're doing something over here that's going to later on smack them in the face. Um, and that's one of your jobs. That's what we call good foreshadowing, um, is when you're waggling something over here and then you smack them on the side of the head. Um, these are all methods of doing that. All right? And this is, this is a shared lie. Everyone who picks up a book knows this isn't real. But they want to participate in this. They want to join in, and they are your willing participant if you can do your job well, which is not kick them out of the story, which is not you know um, do all, all these things we're going to talk about that kind of ruin the experience. And they'll be disappointed or put the book down if you're not tricking them enough. Right. That depends on genre. Um, but yeah. So anyway, quirks. So dossier method. You can find dossiers online character dossiers, lists of questions to ask yourself about your characters. Bloggers love to post these. Um, writing bloggers will be like, 25 questions to ask yourself about every character. And you'll find posts and posts and posts about things like this. Um, I don't use it because I like to, I discovery write my characters. Um, as I told you before, I tend to uh, architect my worlds and my plots, and then cast a character in the role and explore who they are through writing through their eyes. And that usually means I start chapter one three or four times until I find the right character and then I go with it. Yeah. Do you plan, you talk about growth, do you plan where they grow to? Um, after I know who they are, I will. And I will often be revising my outline as I go along because um, you run into this thing, people will talk about characters who, um, who have a life of their own, who just do things you aren't expecting. That doesn't happen to me. I'm an architect. Even though I discover about my characters, I'm always in control of my story. Things don't surprise me. What happens is, as I write along and I, um, I start to really um, figure out this character, I realize, OK, this character is not going to do this thing that the plot calls for, for the, the character in that role to do. And so therefore, I have to go back to my outline. And I have to rebuild my outline using the characters I know who they are now um, to, to work it out. This is why often I actually won't finish my outline until I've got those first few chapters done. I'll do like 75%, then I'll go write the first few chapters, then I'll go back and rebuild my outline now that I know who everybody is. But still, through the course of the book, I will, they will grow, and I will, dis uh, I will discovery write them, meaning I will let them kind of come to fulfill their role or things like this as I go along. All right? Yeah. As a follow-up to that, how, do you, how can you tell if they're, like, what's a good way to tell that they're growing? Like, I don't know. Like, how you OK, we'll talk about that. 
Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, the, it's tough for me to talk about character because I do them so organically. But I can definitely talk about how we know if they're growing or not. All right? So, um, all right. So, dossier method. I'm not going to write that up there because I don't know how to spell dossier. Um, nah, you don't need to tell me. <laughs> I've already moved on. We're beyond that. We're gone. It's French, so it's confusing. Mm -hmm. I know French. Yeah. Um, Next method, this is one that Dave suggested when he taught this class um, many years ago, was to intentionally cast the wrong person in the role in the story that you have built for them. Meaning, if you're working on your plot and you kind of know what type of story you want to do, so you want to tell a heist story or you know, you're going to tell a romance, your first question to yourself is, why can't this person be in this role? What prevents them? What are the big problems? Why would they be much better in the other roles? In other words, you jumble around the roles. You, you, know, you, you, you stick the wise mentor, the person you were planning in that, and instead you make them the romantic interest. And you, know, you take the romantic interest, and instead you make them the plucky sidekick, or whatever it is. You've, you know, you've filled out the role. You've analyzed the plot that you're trying to tell, and you jumble up the roles. Um, the purpose being to force yourself to put square pegs into round holes and pound them in there. Um, this is a source of way of creating conflict. Uh, if your character doesn't feel like they belong in the role they're in, that's generally going to be a good thing, uh, for whatever reason. You know, we, we all are probably tired of um, whiny heroes who don't believe that they're actually a hero, but they also can be the mo some of the most endearing characters. You know, the, the person who doesn't believe they're a hero but is acting heroically, it works really well. Uh, you could probably name off half a dozen stories where you have the reluctant hero who doesn't actually think they're a hero, but they're doing heroic things, and they become, you know, some of the most um, interesting characters in the books because they're in a role they don't think that they fit. Or a person that's a sidekick to the hero, but then it's like, I want to be the hero now, and kind of like, so conflict that way. Yeah, that could be a conflict, whatever. But you just stick them in again. Stick the square peg in the round hole. Find a way. This is, this is another method. You don't have to use any of these. You can, use, you can mix them. But it is a way to force yourself to round out your characters. Uh, the problem here is going to be, generally for new writers, you're going to start writing, and your protagonist is going to be one of two things. Either they're going to be exactly like you, and so they're going to kind of be bland, or they're going to be exactly like <laughs> They're going to be kind of bland because you're not doing the work on them. You're going to cut the corners. You're going to be like, yeah, this is, I know this character. They just are. I mean, this happens a lot. And sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. But if you focus on any sort of uh, groupings of, of characters, usually the main character has trouble in that they tend to be the most bland. Um, they do feel real, but they tend to be the most bland. You can look at Harry Potter and Ron and Hermione. Who's the most bland? Harry, Harry character-wise, is the most bland. Now, there's an argument in YA that people make, which is a pretty legit one, which is that um, the blank slate main character, um, the main character being a blank slate surrounded by interesting people so that you can put yourselves in the, the shoes of the main character and therefore experience it as if you were in there. It's not Harry whose best friend is Ron. It's you whose best friend is Ron. Um, however, that's one argument. You can decide whether to do it. Um, you can decide to go that way if you want to or not, but it is an issue. Um, for some writers that they kind of just assume that the main character is going to either be most like them or they're just the hero, so I don't need to focus on them as much. It's kind of a contrast to what I said earlier. Um, this is just problems that people fall into. Uh, for me, my main characters tended to be very interesting. My side characters tended to be very flat. Um, quirky, but flat, meaning they didn't have passion in life. They were just there to fulfill a role. That's um, what I noticed about myself. All right? So. Um, characters. Making a character sympathetic, one thing that I began to understand as I was writing, uh, this is kind of just a personal philosophy of mine, I realized that there were two general types of characters that I really liked reading about. Um, one was the everyman, right? Um, the everyman was the person who started their quest or their story or whatever, kind of in the same place that I was. They're a normal person who has to get thrust into this great adventure. Um, these are the Frodo's of the worlds, or even really the Sam's of the worlds, right? These are the people who just have you know, no expectation that, that heroism is going to come their way, and then suddenly, boom, it's, it's forced upon them. But we do also like supermen. 
slash women. Um, um, these are very popular stories. Uh, there's a reason why James Bond was a very popular character. There's a reason why Sherlock Holmes is a very popular character. You'll notice, interestingly, that the modern Sherlock Holmes, all the adaptations of modern Sherlock Holmes, are much more deeply flawed than the original. If you go read the original, Sherlock really isn't flawed. Um, I mean, the new Sherlock is great, and you've got this whole you know, sociopath thing going on with him. Go read the original stories. He's not a sociopath. He's just awesome. Okay. Um, <laughs> And Watson is awesome, too. It's like Watson, the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the awesome, and the slightly less awesome, but still very awesome, Watson. Um, and you know they are just really, really, really good at what they do. Um, and this was very much more popular in the, the earlier part of the 20th century. You'll, if you watch the old Superman um, television programs, if you listen to old radio dramas and things like this, they were full of Superman and women. I'm not sure why. Back then, that was so much more popular of an archetype. Um, maybe you know whatever the, the the collective unconscious was was looking for these heroes to look up to um, in certain ways. But you you ended up with a lot of heroes that really didn't have flaws. Um, I mean, you you have more of the you know the limitations. So yeah, Superman can get uh, can get hurt by kryptonite. That's not really a problem with Superman. You know, it's it's just you know. It's not like Superman is deeply flawed as a character because Kryptonite can hit him, hurt him. No, he just only has one thing that can kill him, and we have a billion. Um, yeah. No, so, I mean, is that, would you then suggest that if we have a character that's like a, a Superman that we then try to achieve, like, bigger flaws? In I'm not um, saying anything right now. I'm doing descriptions okay. of, of what seems to work. Um, so this still does work. Um, anyone read a Dirk Pitt novel? Probably, no? Yeah? Okay, so we've got one person. Sahara, yeah. I guarantee, Dirk Pitt sells a lot of copies. He's not necessarily our genre specifically, um, but Dirk Pitt is a modern Superman. Uh, there's nothing wrong with Dirk Pitt. If you read the book, it'll do these things like his flaws or things like he cares too much. Or, you know, he's just... Yes, kids are awesome. Uh, Dirk Pitt, I read, I read a Dirk Pitt novel. It was a blast. But the, the funniest thing was, um, like, there's a scene where, like, his accountant is trapped on an island. And his accountant's like, well, what would Dirk do? And so he, like, is unarmed but goes, takes out all of the bad guys and, like, grabs their rocket launcher and blows their um, helicopter out of the sky. Um, Dirk is so awesome that he makes his accountant awesome by <laughs> proxy, right? This is how awesome Dirk Pitt is. Um, and, you know, these are just... Uh, action adventures filled, I mean, um, uh, the Da Vinci Code. The character from the Da Vinci Code is not flawed, really, in any way, except for that, you know, he just knows too much. And he's just too, you know, it's like all the answers. If, if your flaws are things like if you went to a job interview and they said, what's your worst flaw? The things you would list there, right? Like, oh, I just like working with people too much. Or, you know, um, I'm just, I just, I was, I, I'm an overachiever. I stay at work too long. You know, if those are your character flaws, you're writing a Superman, okay? These do actually work. Um, there, are, there are lots of novels. They don't tend to work in our genre as much, but there are lots of novels that are like this. Um, and you will read them and find out about them and things. I mean, yeah. Uh, they happen in teen girl fiction. You know, the it girl books are about this. They are super women that, you know, have some dire problem happen to them, but they're still a super woman. There's nothing really flawed about them. Um, it's just, you know, life turns against them for a little while, and then they become the it girl again, or whatever. You know, things like that. So your characters generally will be somewhere on this scale. Um, and usually, the really great characters are characters that have a little bit of each, meaning you give us something to admire. This is why we like the Superman, right? We like reading about these books. The Dirk Pitt novel was a blast because they, they, it's kind of wish fulfillment. They do all the cool stuff that we wish we could do. We admire them, um, and we enjoy the, their, their capacity. We talked about it over here. They're capable. Giving a character something they're very capable at doing is a good idea. All right? Oftentimes, um, you know, we get into this sort of flawed character sort of stuff, and we forget to give them something that they're actually very good at. And I feel that this is part of the problem with creating sometimes these bland um, protagonists 
is that they don't actually have anything that they're specifically good at doing. No, there's nothing specifically wrong with the everyman. He just he can't do everything. Right, right. So yeah. with that in mind, how do you give a character a flaw? You know, the well, where did you guys just let me do my lecture? Let me do my lecture. We'll talk about all this stuff. Well, we'll do my lecture. All right. You can ask questions. You just can't. You know, don't don't jump ahead in the lecture. Um, you're you're skipping ahead. Authors don't like that. Yeah. Listen and find out. Um, yeah. We'll we'll get there. We'll get there. Don't worry. Um, but so, Superman. Superman are very capable. Now, what about the everyman? Do we like? Not necessarily the flaws. You're right on that. It's not necessarily the flaws. What do we like? Relatable. Relatable. What, why do we like relatable characters? We are not very specifically good at many fantastic things. Or yeah, fantastic okay. Things. But we think it would be fun to be the hero sometimes. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think that's what you talked about, like the learning curve. And every mm -hmm. man really helps with that. And so it makes you, I mean, you don't feel so stupid. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives you an innate um, help on the learning curve. OK, you see potential for growth. That's very good. Um, yeah? You get to see yourself in those shoes thinking, I wish I could be in that situation that I want. Right, right. I want to find a dragon egg, right? I want, I'm a normal kid. Hey, this normal kid found a dragon egg. Hey, cool. Um, where's my dragon egg? Yeah. Our personality where we like the underdog story. We yeah. want to cheer for the weaker I was, I was actually, that was where I was going to, I was going to go next is underdog. Uh, there is something innate about us that loves the underdog. If we generally don't know anything about a contest, we will end up rooting for the person that is perceived to be weaker. It's human nature. Um, I'm not sure why, but we do. And making a character an, un, um, an everyman makes them relatable, draws us into the, uh, into the story, and gives us a sort of underdog syndrome. Now, you'll notice that um, a lot of modern stories are very good at doing this. Right? Uh, Spider-Man. Spider-Man is this. Uh, Spider-Man is, hey, there's this everyman. Oh, he's turning into a Superman at, through the course of the stories. This is basically the Wheel of Time, right? Here's Rand. Boom, now he can destroy the world. Um, and you read 14 books of him learning how to do that. And it's fun and cool because we love this sense of progress. So this is one method of prog progression that has become very popular in storytelling. This is Luke Skywalker. Right? Luke, through the course of the movies, what do we see by the third movie? By the third movie, Luke is Superman. Um, right? He's, he's Obi-Wan. And we get this sort of reference in the first movie of, here's the mentor. This is what Luke's going to become. We see him becoming that in the second movie. In the third movie, he is that. Um, so this is, this is just one easy method um, and time-tested method of giving your character a sense of progress. Um, progress is important. Um, we haven't really dug into flaws, and that's the next place I want to go. Um, I personally break down flaws by uh, character flaws being different from me from you know, physical limitations. And there is some blurred line between the character flaw, the physical mental limitations, and handicaps. Again, these are just ways that I've, I've learned to look at it. These are not necessarily strict definitions. It's not like you go to someone and, they, and, and you could go to any writer and say, what's the difference between a limitation and a handicap? And they'd be like, ah, one gets you a sticker, one doesn't. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, this is just my way of thinking of it. Uh, the way I divide it up is character flaws, it is the character's fault. Er's fault. All right. This is not the character's fault, but it is something internal they need to deal with. And these are external. external limitations, all right? So um, breaking it up this way helps me as a writer when I'm looking at my story and deciding how I'm going to tell this story, how to approach overcoming these things. If, one of you, if your character has a, a, a handicap, 
it isn't necessarily the right thing to like, you know, the story be about, um, about overcoming that. That's just a part of who they are. If your character has one arm and they want to be a, a football player, you don't want your story to be about them learning how to regrow genetically a new arm, probably. Um, this is a function of who they are. And it is something that they're going to have to deal with, certainly. But it is a factor, of, it's something that, that, that is just external to them, usually. Another good example of a handicap is Aunt May in the Spider-Man movies. Um, you don't want Peter Parker to have to overcome Aunt May. I mean, you don't want his, it, it, there's no sort of arc there where he's like, you should just get rid of Aunt May. But Aunt May is a handicap, ha to a having her. What's that? She has a chance. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, that's going a different direction, but um, you know, someone's very passionate with his Batman shirt about his comics. Um, oh, and Adam West Batman even. Um, so external limitations. These are things your character is going to have to work with that we don't necessarily want them to overcome in any way. They're just there. All right? These can be helpful. For, um, for filling out you know, what makes it harder for your character to do what they do. Um, physical and mental limitations. Um, these, for me, are just limits on what they're capable of doing. Um, for instance, if um, uh, this is Superman, he's got this whole kryptonite thing, right? He is going to have to overcome it. He's going to have to work around it. But for me, the sort of physical mental limitations are just Things for me to keep in mind, this is what they can't do. Um, this is actually Sanderson's second law of magic also, by the way. Um, I build my magic systems this way. Uh, they, they, there will be limitations to the magic system. They may cause character um, mo emotion and things like this. But basically, this is just what that you can and can't do. Like I said, the lines between these are very blurry. Um, an external limitation, the, the one iron football player is probably more the physical limitation. Um, and this is, I'm looking at the external things. Um, but I'm building these two as things that aren't necessarily the character's fault, but still will have to be overcome in some way. These are the ones that are the character's fault that, that build your growth arc. All right? They are the character's fault. They are something the character can actively change. Um, they are important to who the character is when they begin the story, but they are not necessarily um, who the character has to be by the end of the story. And these are all the things you probably think of when we talk about flaws. But the thing to keep in mind is that um, when you're building these for your character, they don't need to be terribly um, awful things. Like when I say building character flaws, people are like, hmm, they're a sadist and they like to burn cats. Um, <laughs> OK, that is indeed a deep character flaw. Um, but it can be something as simple as they're too shy, right? Um, this character is very shy, and they need to overcome their shyness. Um, this character is, um, you know, is exceptionally rude, and they learn, need to learn to not be exceptionally rude. This character always jumps into their problems feet first without thinking. Um, there, there are as many of these as there are people out there. Uh, and these are where you want to spend your time thinking and saying, I'm going to make my character more flawed. Why do we do this? Because it makes fun. them more relatable. It adds conflict. It adds conflict. Very good. It adds conflict. And if the character is flawed and more relatable, people will actually read your story and buy the book. That's right. That's right. I need to be throwing these out. Did you bring these again? Oh, awesome. There we are. You have, you've answered like a bunch. Here you go. There's three. Um, <laughs> Who just answered that other one? It was somewhere over here. Woo! I'm going to throw it at you. Oh, there it's on the floor. Um, that's all right. Answer more questions, you'll get, then you'll get Sour Patch Kids. I'm going to throw you the oranges, because I don't like those. Um, <laughs> building character flaws. This is, should be part of your process for developing a character these days. The reason being, as I said, the, the holy Superman characters, don't, they, you know, they just aren't necessarily they're just not that cool anymore. Uh, we've gotten beyond that. Um, there's a reason why the, the movie studios have had so much trouble rebooting Superman. Because Superman is a character from the old days. And ha coming up with a way that Superman can be interesting is tough. It's doable. 
Um, it, you do it by making them very relatable. And there, I'm certain there are other ways. But there's a reason why Batman has been so popular, because Batman is flawed. Oh, Batman has so many flaws. And we're like, yes, you are so flawed, but you're also awesome. I want to re um, experience the story about you being flawed and awesome. And if you go back to the early Superman, mm -hmm. like the, the animated black and white, right. he's like flying over to Europe and beating up the fascists. It's not, yeah. it's not this realistic thing. It's more of like this allegory for... Yeah, yeah. Well, the storytelling was, was what also made Superman like really relatable in the past was the fact that Superman, even though he you know had like all these superpowers and stuff like that, when it came to Lois Lane as ideal girl, he was really shy about right, the whole thing. Right, right. And so that made him really relatable. Once he marries Lois Lane, now mm -hmm. he's got all these superpowers and he's got his dream girl, and Superman readership dropped like crazy, like nobody cared anymore. Right, right. I know that, and that is a very good thing. Superman, when he he works, he has trouble relating. It's the Clark Kent that's interesting. Um, it's not the Superman. Um, and yeah. Um, if I remember typically, Superman character kind of changes a lot depending on like, the universes. And yeah, yeah. Every, they're, different writers have taken so many different takes on Superman. I'm curious to see how the new movie this summer does. Um, because it, it, everyone, you know, there's this exploration of how do we make Superman work? Um, and you as writers, um, you do want to have superheroic characteristics, you know, superpowers, it, will it be, for your characters. I think the best characters always do, even if it's something as simple as, against Sam. Sam is the one I listed as kind of the, the everyman over here, the, the, the paradigm of everyman, but he has a superpower. He is extremely loyal. He is superhumanly loyal. Um, he has loyalty like Superman has, um, has super strength um, in equal measures. And that loyalty that he expresses is part of what makes us fall in love with him. Historically, poll after poll, Sam is chosen as the favorite character in The Lord of the Rings um, by readership. Overwhelmingly chosen as the favorite character. Um, and I think it's because of that mixture of every man and Superman. In the books, Aragorn is a Superman. If you read the books, um, uh, one of the things Peter Jackson did is he humanized Aragorn a little bit more, gave him this sort of do I become king or not sort of thing. That isn't in the books. In the books, Aragorn is just the man. Um, it's like, all right, how many orcs are we going to slay today, Aragorn? Well, I'm going to shoot for 700. How about you, Gimli? I might hit 650. Okay, let's go. I mean, that's, um, you know, that's, that's how the, it goes. He is an expression of this. I mean, um, Tolkien was a Beowulf scholar. Uh, Aragorn is Beowulf. He is the, the superhuman warrior um, king. And that, uh, that works in there, but people don't generally go like, oh, Aragorn, I love Aragorn, he's so interesting. I mean, they'll read about him, but then they, when they start talking, it's usually Sam followed closely by Gollum um, as people's favorite characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, and so this is relating to this sort of thing. So as you're building your character, um, you, you, you want to start asking yourself, what, what limitations do they have? External handicaps, physical limitations, um, mental hang-ups. I mean, um, you, could, you can make the argument, I don't put something like depression in here. Depression is a demon to work against. It is not a character flaw, um, if that makes sense. And dividing those two in my head is very important for me as an author to understanding my character. If one of my characters have, has depression, it's not getting rid of depression that is their, their character arc. Their character arc is dealing with the emotional ramifications of that and becoming the, a person, you know, a flaw can be I don't know yet know how to deal with my depression. The depression is a limitation. The flaw is I don't deal with it very well. This can change. This doesn't necessarily have to. Um, now, there are stories about overcoming these. Okay, those things do exist, and you can write that story. But I approach it very differently than I approach this. Okay, questions? Yes. Is there like any inherent trade-off, like epicness and relatability? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I would say there definitely is. There's inherent trade-off between maybe not epicness, but sheer awesomeness versus relatability. Um, now. The, so the giving up 10% of sheer awesomeness and gaining 120% of relatability, I mean, you, there is a trade-off there. You're losing 10% awesomeness, but what you gain is so much more useful for your story. But there is that. And you can make the argument that there are readers out there that just would rather have that 10%. 
and that's why we still have stories um, that focus on these superhuman characters that just do everything right. And if they have a flaw, it's that they're just too good. Um, <laughs> yeah, so our, you know, they're unwilling to bend on their convictions. Um, that's one I've read before. It's just like, you know, his only flaw was that he wasn't willing to be evil. Um, you know, yeah. That is actually one of Superman's um, limitations. Um, code of honor. Uh, a lot of the superheroes have a code of honor. It is something to deal with, but it is not something to overcome because the way you know to overcome it would be to just get rid of it. Um, though, so there are some very good stories about you know a code of ethics that gets broken and what that does to the character. Um, you can write those stories if you want, but yeah, how the code of ethic gets in the way and things like that. But again. I, I talk about it this way so you can start defining these two groups in your head to help you really split them apart because you approach them differently. Um, with flaws, my goal is to show incremental progress. All right, here you are. Incremental progress. The, um, we will talk about this in the plotting section, but to give you a, a preview, um, plot is about a sense of, excuse me, sense of progression. Plot is not about actual progression. It's about giving a sense of regression. The reason for this is that all of these things are arbitrary in your book. All right? You can make 10 minutes last 1,000 pages if you want to. Or you can cover 10 minutes in a couple of words. This is, you have complete control over this. You have complete control over the character's progress. You can have them change in an instant. You are fully capable of doing that in your writing. You are capable, usually, of ending the book in chapter two if you wanted to. You could write that ending. It wouldn't be satisfying, but you can do it. So the story is about giving this sense of progression in a satisfying way. It's not necessarily about that ending, because you could give them that ending at any point. It's interesting to consider that, to keep that in mind. So with your flaw, incremental progress toward the flaw is going to be very helpful. Um, this is where the thing that you've probably learned in high school that looks like this comes in. All right. Um, that's because usually you have this thing, this sort of, hey, they're working on this. Oh, they backslid. Hey, they're working on this. Oh, they backslid. Hey, they're working on this. Woohoo, we survived. And then, you know, Dane and Wah. Um, this, is, this is usually used for plots, but that's basically what you're, you're looking at. Um, it, it works for all these things. And so your idea for giving the character progress on, their, um, on their, what they're working on is this sort of method. All right? So if your, your idea is that you know, your character jumps into things too quickly, you probably actually will start like this, down, 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 down. And then like, OK, then you realize you need to work on it. Oh, they made a mistake. Oh, you know, you'll start going like this, because you need to establish that they're doing something wrong at the beginning. Uh, your challenge in doing this is making sure that they remain proactive and that you don't turn the reader off. A lot of writers like to do this thing where they like make their character very, very flawed at the beginning. They're going to be this great anti-hero, and then they're going to turn into a real hero and things like that. And then your, character, your readers hate your character, and it's very hard to get them beyond those initial chapters. This is where having them be relatable and flawed at the same time comes into your story. Um, now. You can tell great stories about characters who are exemplary. They don't have to have all of these things, who are exemplary in a few of the areas. And if you're writing a true sort of um, a story about you know, an unsympathetic protagonist, you can skip the sympathetic and make them super, super capable and super, super proactive. And it'll work. Um, it's not necessarily the right thing for every story, but it does work. In fact, you, you, you'll, you can probably pull out a host of sort of supervillain stories that do this at the beginning. Um, things like Despicable Me um, and whatnot. They're super capable. They're super proactive. Um, you know, those stories are also comedies, which really helps, honestly. Um, doing that without the comedy would be a whole lot tougher. But since you've got the comedy and you're really there for the comedy, you show capable, you show proactive. Um, you know, Mega Mind is another one of these. Um, and you know, even though they're getting foiled, he's getting foiled by the superhero. You see all this cool stuff that he's capable of doing, and then he actually succeeds. That sort of thing. 
Um, was there? You yeah, I had a question uh -huh. um, specifically about this idea of making a character proactive, <laughs> because I feel like you know, again, we have the situation where yep. we have characters that are reacting to things that they didn't expect to happen. Mm -hmm. So how is it that we go about making them? Proactive, working towards something that is not related to the main action of the story. That's a fantastic question. You win a gold star um, in the form of a sour patch kid. Um, so, good question. Um, th this is basically digging into the villain dilemma. How do we make our heroes as interesting as our villains when they're reacting against our villains? Or how do I make the protagonist of my story protag? Howard likes to say that. Um, protagonist, protag. Uh, it's a verb. Um, how do you make your protagonist protag? Um, one way is to look at their hobbies and passions and have them be working toward one of those as they're being interrupted and they keep doing it. Um, a good example of this is, I mean, we, we oftentimes people use the opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark as a great way to establish sympathy and ruining interest for a character who is following their passion and yet things are going wrong, right? Um, at the end of the opening for Raiders of the Lost Ark, go watch it again, Indiana Jones does not end up with the idol that he was trying to get for his museum. But he tries so hard, and he is so capable, um, despite getting knocked down, he becomes an underdog, despite how capable he is. And this shows we start the story with him being very proactive. And then... From there, you know, he goes on this adventure to deal with Nazis, and Nazis keep getting in his way, and he can react against the Nazis. But since we started off with this extremely proactive start, um, it helps us cement in our mind Indiana Jones is an active character who's working toward his passions. Uh, so showing your character in a scene where they are pursuing some sort of hobby or interest or goal of theirs, and then that gets interrupted because of what's going on, can initially establish our character in an interesting way as someone who does things. Um, I'm using a lot of adventure stories as my examples. This, this doesn't necessarily have to be an adventure story. This works just as well for a, you know, a young kid in school who is, you know, their passion is art, and they're going to get interrupted by moving to a new city and having to deal with things. Um, and you could see how showing them initially being passionate about something and then finding out that they have to leave and leave it all behind could be helpful in establishing rooting interest and the, the, how the capable the character is before you uproot them and then start telling their story where everything's against them. They move to the new place, everybody hates them, um, and you know, there's, there's some rival who's trying to destroy this, uh, this poor girl's life, and how do we deal with this and all of these things. So. Show them. That's one way. Show them doing these things. Um, another way is what we call the try-fail cycle, which is um, we'll do a lot more of this in the plotting section. But the idea is that you have your character try initially and fail to achieve to to, to work against the problems. Um, there's a, there's an old adage in um, in in storytelling that has to do with uh, that. I've recently seen it. Um, post is an internet, um, internet meme. Meme? You say meme, don't you? Yeah. Um, which is, um, people like to point at Han Solo. When uh, on this, the second Star Wars movie, uh, when the doors open and they're expecting to go to dinner and there is Darth Vader there, what does Han Solo do? He pulls out his gun and shoots. <laughs> All right? He doesn't say, you betrayed me. He doesn't say, whoa, Darth Vader's here. He takes out his gun and shoots. Does it work? No. It's futile, but he tries. And we have, because of things that he does, cemented in our head that Han is proactive. Han does stuff. Han doesn't say, oh, I'm so surprised. So Han gets out his gun and shoots. Um, and this establishes a huge amount of rooting interest on our parts with Han. Despite being you know, somewhat deeply flawed in a lot of areas, we love Han because of this. This is really what makes Han awesome. Han is actually not that capable. He's OK capable. But he's really not that capable. He usually doesn't do things right, and they don't usually work out. But boy, is Han proactive. Han doesn't stand there. Han's, Han picks up the microphone and starts talking. Yeah, everything's OK here. How are you? Um, you know? And we laugh. Um, but we love Han because of that.
right? This is another way to make your character proactive in the face of something going um, very wrong is they do things. They don't just sit there and, and, um, and say, oh, no, or get worried or run hide. You know, they're the ones that are like, well, uh, dragons are attacking our city. I'm going to go and try and shoot my catapult at them because I'm not a very good warrior, but I built a, what, a ballista. I'm going to take them down. Um, we like that kid in, um, in How to Train Your Dragon because when the dragons attack, even though he's the weakest, smallest one, he doesn't go hide. He goes and grabs on his, best, his Bastille and tries to take one down. Um, and that's what this is, okay? This is the proactive stuff. I keep talking to this one. I mean this one. All right. Wait, so is the proactiveness, is that like mostly facade? Because, I mean, there's lots of movies where, like, the heroes being all proactive, like, they're almost stopping it or, like, yes. they succeed. And then, essentially, at the end of the day, the villain's plot step A proceeds perfectly. And then they yeah. go step B, he tries to stop step B, and then and they only... Oh, so it's only the very end where they actually like, stop the villain from succeeding. Yes, that's what I was talking about earlier, where you could have them succeed in Chapter 2, and your story would be done. Um, it's all a facade. Everything in a story is a facade. Kate, get that in your head. You are making it up. You have absolute control. There is no realism. You, you, I mean, even if your story is a Jane Austen-esque um, romance, you know what? In chapter two, the arrogant guy that offended her in chapter one, she could find out that he's actually very sweet, and they could fall in love, and the story could end. And you could make that ending happen. Now, Telling your stories about, you know, again, people are going to buy into this. You have to do it in a way that they buy into it. You, um, you don't want to, as a friend of mine says, do deus ex wrench. I'll get to you in a sec. Deus ex wrench. I think Howard came up with this one too. I can't remember. No, 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 no. This was, uh, this was Bryce, um, uh, Bryce Moore. Um, he called something called deus ex wrench where the Deus Ex Machina is where the reader feels that the, the, he, the author artificially saved the heroes in the end when they shouldn't have been saved. Deus Ex Wrench is where you artificially inflate the length of your story um, to the reader's noticeability by throwing in problems that don't feel realistic. Um, and this is, this is a real issue. You want your, the problems and issues to feel real. Um, this is also called idiot plotting, if you do it the wrong way. Meaning, the only reason that uh, the characters don't get together or that anything goes wrong in the book is because the characters are idiots. That's a bad place to be. Um, and the difference between the characters being idiots and the characters being real characters with, with deep flaws is a matter of good writing and foreshadowing, really. If you can convince us in chapter one that this flaw that the character has is a real issue preventing them from getting together with the, 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 the character that you want them to get together with in chapter three, the reader will buy into it. It's OK. We all have flaws. We understand this. They're going to work on it. If instead they have no realistic reason um, in chapter three, you haven't done your job right. And it looks artificial. It is all artificial. Your job is to make it not look artificial. Does that help, help Scott? Do you understand? So. Going back to an earlier example, you were mentioning dragons attacking. Yes. Dragons attacking is a situation, but at the same time, there's somebody who's able to be proactive in the situation. Do you need to have a balance between situation and proactivity, or is there a way to have them both in the same place? I don't know what you mean by situation versus proactivity in that statement. You there said earlier question. on that yeah. if you just throw a situation at a character and then they react to it, then yeah. they become a reactionary, bland character. Right. But it seems... Well, no, no, that doesn't, doesn't necessarily make them 100% bland. What it makes them is reactionary, and we lose some of our rooting interest. And you're right. The problem is that the rooting interest tends to go to the person being proactive, and this is the villain problem. Uh, you know, if the characters are only reacting to the villains, we, we sometimes have an issue. In Hollywood, they actually split this up by, by doing three acts and saying, you're OK in act one reacting. Hollywood says, act one is react. Um, act two is um, is try and make it work worse. In other words, the you know now you you've you've tried now reacting is different from being proactive and saying okay we need to do something about this rather than just waiting for the villain to do something and stopping them. That's reaction. Action is there's a villain in town. I need to outthink him and lay a trap for him. Is proactive rather than reactionary. There's a bit of reaction to it, but you're never going to get rid of that bit of reaction. Um, so in Hollywood, it is act one, react, 
Act two, make it worse. Act three, try a Hail Mary, and it succeeds. Um, right? Um, I don't particularly love three-act format simply because um, the way that Hollywood talks about things, they're very smart people. They know what they're doing, but they're limited by their screen length. And because of that, they tend to focus very much on, you need this here, you need this here, you need this here. You only have you know, 100 pages to tell your story. Um, we're telling stories that are much more free form. And because of that, we don't have necessarily to worry as much about the rigidity of these sorts of things. But there's a lot you can learn from three-act format with this. And so in, in your question right here, what they would say is, yes, the character's reacting. And they'll probably spend the first act only reacting. Then they will find ways to start acting, and the, but the problem's going to get worse. And then they do a very proactive thing at the end, which is crazy and outside the box. And wow, I can't believe anybody thought of that. We're going to need lots of guns. Um, yeah, um, this sort of thing. Nobody fights back against an agent, right? You can't do that. Um, the outside the box, super proactive thing, and then it succeeds. And that's their format. Um, I would say to you, Initially, yes, there's going to be some reaction, but there's this balance between reacting and acting. For instance, dragons are attacking, we've got to go hide, is much more of a reactive reaction than dragons are attacking, I'm going to go get my super crossbow. Um, and yes, it's a reaction, but the next step is to go do something about it. Um, and the do something about it is like, I'm going to, the reason I think that scene works is it's not just I'm going to do something about it. Obviously, what everyone else is doing isn't working because the dragons keep attacking. This one character is saying, no, I'm going to try and do something new that maybe will stop the dragons permanently. And that's much more proactive. And I think it's part of why that character works so well in that movie is because from the get-go, we have this sense of everybody else is, is really just reacting. Even though they're fighting, they're not doing anything. And he's trying to stop it. OK? okay but that's a specific example. Really, the idea is you want to kind of look at these. And when we talk about plotting, you want to try and figure out what about these plots, um, plotting methods works for me. Um, how do I like doing this? Do I like try-fail cycles? Do I like the three-act format? Do I like the roadmap method of plotting um, and doing all these sorts of things? Um, so uh, I went forever on that. But we did get into plot a little bit, which at least gives you some of the plot lecture. Um, I'm going to not talk about viewpoint, because that would go too long. And I'm going to finish up um, talking about magic systems from last week. And then we'll be done and go to writing groups, all right? Um, so this, the reason I chose to do this lecture today is because this whole flaws and limitations things really is about how uh, a big part of how I develop magic systems. The second um, rule of magic I've given to myself. Again, these aren't like hard, fast rules. This isn't like I read a book and say, oh, they're breaking Sanderson's second law. This is a bad magic system. Um, these are rules I use for myself to help me make my magic systems more interesting and my stories more interesting. Um, second, um, Brandon's second law, Sanderson's second law, is that limitations are more interesting than the powers themselves. And this tends to be true. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, magic is an interchangeable technology. And like I said, this really kind of applies to a lot of things. For instance, I think that um, what is going wrong in your world is generally going to be more interesting than what's going right. Um, generally, the things your character can't do are going to be more interesting to your reader than the things they can do. The things they can do can still be very interesting. But the things they're not capable of doing are generally where your story lies. And so that's what people focus on. And so this is a greater storytelling thing. To go back to comic books, um, because uh, a lot of us have seen these movies, we go to Batman. The things that Batman can do are pretty cool. We like reading about them. But those don't make stories. The problems that the, when the, the villains play into Batman's like, issues, that's where a story comes from. And his flaws tend to be what drives our story. Um, the same thing happens with Superman. Stories in, um, um, in at least modern day Superman uh, tellings are not about Superman being able to fly. They're about someone has kryptonite, right? The flaws li and limitations are where your story generally happens. For your, what's that? I said he can't stop world hunger. Yeah, he can't stop world hunger. That's true. Um, uh, didn't he push an iceberg, fly an iceberg to, to Africa once or something like that, though? Yeah. So he stopped a drought. Um, so that was 
that was something. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> let's get back to this with magic system. Um, good magic system, in my opinion, has limitations and, and, and flaws. Um, and I do divide these in my head, um, meaning you know, the, what the magic can't do and uh, what holes or problems there are in the magic. Like what, when you use the magic, what kind of problems does it cause? Um, and usually it should cause some sort of problem. Uh, this can be minor. It can be, yes, using the magic costs money and we don't have a lot of it. Um, or it can be the magic, uh, using the magic makes me very tired. And that's bad because then people can stab me. Um, that one is very is a standby. I've used it myself. I encourage you to, to look beyond. Don't use that one too often. Uh, come up with interesting limitations. Orson Scott Card um, suggests one in his book that he ended up using, which is when you use the magic, someone close to you dies. Um, you know, it like kills one of your grandparents when you use the magic. Um, that's a pretty big flaw in the magic system. And you can only use it a limited number of times, um, usually when you're younger. Uh, <laughs> and things like that. Like it requires like some blood sacrifice or things like this. Um, you can go all sorts of directions with this. But coming up with interesting flaws and limitations to your magic system. Um, for me, a limitation is more like um, in the Mistborn series, I wrote a telekinesis. You can move things with your mind. I put a limitation on it that says you can only move metals, and they have to be directly away from you. And, or pull directly towards you um, using vector physics, right? Uh, you know, mass versus mass and things like this. Uh, this limitation, actually, for me as a writer, was the most fun thing about the magic system. I had seen telekinesis done a lot. Uh, Star Wars does telekinesis. Everybody does telekinesis. X-Men does telekinesis. And yet, limiting it specifically to the pushing and pulling forced me to be more creative with how I used it, which in turn forced my characters to be more creative, which allowed the readers <coughs> to say, wow, that was clever what this character just did, which is different from this character can move things with their mind, and so they just move this, and it happens. You don't think, oh, that was clever. You think, OK, they did that. That's within their powers. That's good. Um, but when a character does something that, that they use the limitations to their advantage or they work around them, it allows you to make the characters very capable. Um, and I have found more and more that what the magic can't do um, becomes more interesting than what it can do. And so, like we just talked about with characters, when you start developing your magic or your technology in your books, start asking yourself these limitations. What can't it do? And when using it, what does it cost? That's really, for me, like the flaw of the magic. It's, they're, they're different for characters and things, but what, is, what does that cost? Um, what does it do when you do it? Uh, other ways you can limit the magic are based on you know, how you get the magic. Uh, being born with it is, of course, the old standby. But if you aren't born with it, how you get it can be very interesting. If you have to kill somebody to gain their magical power, that's a very different story. Throws in lots of conflict, and it makes um, an interesting flaw slash limitation to the magic system, um, particularly if your character wants to have the magic, these sorts of things, or if your character has the magic, and people are hunting them down to chop off their head to get their share of it. Um, so it makes the magic more interesting, all right? So flaws versus limitations. We just had a whole lecture on this. I, I think you can probably apply that to magic. Um, the last one is the one I haven't come up with the, a pithy enough phrase for yet. Um, but the concept of the last law is that everything is interconnected. And a really good magic system, you're in, in a book with a really good magic system, your job as an author is to outthink the reader about the ramifications of that magic. All right? Readers who read science fiction and fantasy, love interesting magics or technologies. They tend to like these things. But one of the reasons they read specifically science fiction is they want to see what ramifications, how the world would be different if this interesting technology existed. How would, um, how would cyberspace, if we could actually you know, upload our brains to, to, uh, to the computers, how would that change everyday life? And that's the thing you've got to ask yourself, and you've got to connect it to everything. A good magic system isn't just about magic. It involves economics. It therefore involves warfare, and it involves uh, how the governments relate to each other. Theoretically, a really good magic is going to have some sort of relationship and tie to the ecology of the world in which you're working, um, 
and it's going to relate to the cultures, the religions, all of these things. Religion changes a lot when magic is real. Um, and your job is to extrapolate these things. In technology, how does a religion deal with technology? How does a religion deal with the fact that you could become immortal by uploading your brain to a computer? Do you still have a soul, or did the soul die and this is just a copy of your soul? Interconnect these things. Um, urban fantasy is a little bit tougher, simply because the world is going to be the same world. But you still want to ask yourself these things. Like, if you've got your main character, you're doing a Dresden Files sort of magic so sort of thing, let's say. Um, you've got a main character who's using the magic. What is their opinion on religion? Magic is real. Are devils and angels real? If so, how does that change their, um, their, their look at religion? How do people with magic, how have they influenced the economy? And, you know... Um, Harry Potter, they're like, well, they've got a bureau in the government that deals just with them. Um, Harry Potter um, does the normal thing of children's, which is with, with the secondary world, which is it really doesn't affect the real world. Um, you can get away with that depending on your genre. And in urban fantasy, you're probably going to have to. But readers are going to want to know how your interesting magic things affect the economy of the people who know about it. Can you pay someone to use this magic? If so, so how much does it cost? Um, this, is, this is a very, very big issue for storytelling. It doesn't exist in some of the other genres. For instance, in games, you don't have to worry about this. Um, if you're, you, know, you happen to be writing a video game, you don't ask yourself, man, these people can turn mud into diamonds. That would ruin the economy if, if diamonds are worth anything, wouldn't it? You don't have to worry about that in a video game. Yeah, um, but in a book, you better ask yourself, if they can make diamonds, what are diamonds worth? And why would they be worth anything at all? Uh, what does it cost to make them? These sorts of things. You've got to be asking yourself that. So third law, good magic is interconnected with the world around it. And you have thought further than the reader in extrapolating the ramifications of that magic. And I want to let you go so that we have time. Um, I will have substitutes for you. Uh, the next two weeks, I think. Um, I might be back the third week. I don't know. 